How are you? Good? It's actually warmer than I thought it was going to be, which is good because I had no wind. Okay, folks. So I've done about three quarters of evaluations. Now, it, no, and I've about a hundred left in your class and a hundred in the other one. So I'll have to get them done sometime soon because I've quizzed a grade this evening and other stuff. A couple of things. One is your next quiz is a week from today, so you'll be getting the specifics on seeding and. It'll cover pretty much the rest of DCF. It's non-cumulative, but that's kind of a lie, right? Because if you really don't get betas and risk-free rates and risk premiums, you're lost. You know, I can't build on top of it, but the foundation's going to melt away. I won't ask you to estimate a bottom-up beta. That I think you should be able to do already, even though I might be wrong in that one. But I'll build on that. So, I'll, so this will be about the mechanics of DCF. Those loose ends, cross holdings, cash, that's where I'd spend the bulk of my attention. On the, pro, on the DCFs themselves, uh, I, I was getting a little mean towards like the 150th DCF. I am sorry. I was just, uh, physically, I just could not, uh, mentally I was hitting... So if I got, if you got a mean response back, it's because I just, I was, so I'll take it back. Whatever that mean thing was, I'm sorry I was mean to you, but bring in your DCF. There's probably a good reason I was mean to you on that DCF, so let's fix that even though the meanness will not go away. Now, if you're building your own spreadsheet, a couple of suggestions, less is more, right? Don't build know hundreds of line items it's I know what investment banks do but it's so easy to lose sight of the forest for the trees it's so easy so if you build a lot of detail because you like building detail have a separate sheet which is just your valuation where you compress it down to six or seven line items because remember we talked about stories it's very difficult to see a story when you're 500 line items because you're so caught up in SGNA and how it's growing over time you're missing it so you know, I, so if you, if you have a spreadsheet, and that's where I got meanest is when I got a spreadsheet and got line 331 and said, I give up. And go back and see if you can compress what you've done on it. You don't have to start from scratch. It just means looking at your own numbers to see if they make sense in a big picture perspective. So today we're going to do a lot of valuation. So I'm going to give you a preview by looking at some of the questions we're going to address. So let's say you're valuing a company where corporate governance is poor. I'm going to leave it at that, and you, want, you de de determine for yourself why it matters. Let's say the firm is badly managed, and you come up with a DCF value of $100 million for the firm. Should you attach a discount to that value? Because there's bad corporate governance. You're saying, what is bad corporate governance? What did Lyft, when they did the IPO, what did they do? They, they had two classes of shares, right? So in a sense, we already know corporate governance is pretty much dead in the water at Lyft. There's nothing you're going to be able to do. It's by design. So when you do a DCF valuation, should you discount the value for bad corporate governance? You said no. Why not? And that's really the question. Was it? And when people talk about DCFs, they act like it's some number that came out of nowhere. It's your DCF. You made assumptions. And what does bad corporate governance mean? that you can't change the management of a company, right? So if you have a badly managed company, you're kind of stuck with it. In your DCF, here's what I'm looking at. Did you build the bad management into your cash flows as bad projects, terrible debt ratio? And if you have already, guess what? The 100 million is already a discounted value, and it reflects the fact that you can't change. But here's the reality. When you do DCF, sometimes you forget what you're doing. You act like you run the firm. So what do you do? You fix the problems on your spreadsheet. 
You make low margins into high margins, bad projects into good projects, you move your company towards a target debt ratio. Then I have no idea what your DCF is. It could be a DCF with some. Then you might have to attach a discount. How much of a discount? You'll have to actually go back and redo the valuation with those bad inputs built in. So we're going to talk about valuing emerging market companies, and I'm going to go through this process of dealing with bad corporate governance. But if you do your DCF in a way that's transparent, where you can see what you're doing, you won't have to discount the value that you get. It should be already embedded in that. Here's the second question. You've done a DCF valuation of a pharmaceutical company. And you've done it using the traditional definitions of earnings, what, what the accountants have, have put in there. But we talked about the, how those numbers don't make sense. You remember the class, you capitalize R&D, you redo everything, and you re-estimate the value of a company. Will capitalizing R&D, what effect will it have? Now, I'll give you the choices. The first is it will have no effect on value because you move things around, you still have the same, same free cash flow. You think that's the answer? If that were the answer, We've just wasted our time, right? There's a reason we capitalize R&D. It's because we think it will change value. So here's my question. Will capitalizing R&D at your company increase value, decrease value, or is it possible that value could be unchanged? How many think it will increase value? <clears throat> Let's think of the, the effects, right? If you capitalize R&D, for the most part, your earnings went up. For many of your companies, when you capitalize R&D, you notice a margin jumped. That's the good news. The bad news is it now becomes part of your invested capital. So your reinvestment now is a much bigger number. See what already the net consequence is going to be. It depends on which effect dominates. When I capitalize R&D for Merck, I knock down the value $10 per share. When I capitalize the value for Amgen, I increase the value $10 per share. They're both pharmaceutical companies. What's different about them? Merck wastes money on R&D for the last 10 years. It spent $100 billion plus on R&D has nothing to show for it. So when I capitalize R&D, I'm holding them up to a standard up. Hey, are you taking good R&D? And the answer is no. So I punish them. That's why we capitalize R&D is to treat it as an investment as, is this a company that does good R&D, bad R&D, or neutral R&D? So the effects can cut depending on your company. Finally, let's say you're valued a distressed company. Distressed in what sense? It's losing money and has a lot of debt. On your spreadsheet, you fix every one of its problems. By doing what? By doing what we do in spreadsheets. We raise the margins, lower the debt ratio, make the company a nice, healthy company. We give it a big terminal value. We discount it all back. We come up with a value of a billion for the equity in the firm. Given that setup, that this is a money-losing company with a lot of debt, even if I've done my DCF right, I've followed every rule in terms of you know, making sure the growth rate doesn't, the return on capital is, moves the cost of capital. Is that billion dollar value going to be too high or too low a number for this company, and why? Am I overestimating the value of a distressed company with a DCF or underestimating its value? In a DCF, what do we assume happens to every company? It becomes a going concern. And if you have a company where that is very, a very high property event, your DCF is your DCF. But in a company like this, what are you worrying about every year? Will I make it next year, right? Because that's what lots of debt and negative earnings do. And it's not just companies which are older companies with a lot of debt. It could be many of your young startups. In fact, a third of this class, you're valuing startups. You have this very optimistic path you've given me, and I said, okay, I can see your path, but one of the things you've got to keep in your mind is you've got negative cash flows. In your own valuation, take a look at your cash flows for the next six or seven years. They're all negative, and your company has to live through that cash burn, and if it doesn't make it, your DCF is null and void, which effectively means your DCF is the value for your company if it makes it as a going concern, but to the extent that it doesn't, you've got a problem. And today we're going to talk about, towards the end maybe, or maybe in the next session, we're going to talk about how to adjust a DCF value for the fact that some companies don't make it. So with all of those in place, let me go back to where we were. In class. Tomorrow I'm supposed to go into Evercore. I don't know whether they read all the things I've written about them, but I guess if they've read it, they ignore it to talk at a macro conference, which to me is like a vegetarian wandering into a beef, uh, into a butcher's convention or something, because I'm not a macro person. 
But there, this is a group of portfolio managers who gather together to, through an annual write-up where they do this dance of where will the market go next year. Investors spend a lot of time on this portfolio management. So I'm actually the lead speaker. I'm going to show up at 9 o'clock, and they're going to expect me to tell them whether the market is undervalued or overvalued. Notice I've never even raised that issue in this class. I've, never, I've talked about companies being under overvalued. But could you value an entire market using an intrinsic valuation model? What do I need to value a company? I need cash flows, growth, and risk, right? So if I can do that for an entire market, I can value a market. I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to explain why I don't try to do this on a regular basis. But let's take the S&P 500. Let's suppose I wanted to value the S&P 500. Let's go old-fashioned. Let's value the S&P 500 using a dividend discount model. So to value the S&P 500 at the start of 2015, in fact, I update this on my... When, I, when you do the implied equity risk premium spreadsheet, this actually is part of that spreadsheet, so you can get an updated version of it. Start of 2015, if I value the S&P 500, the S&P 500 had dividends of about 38.57 on the entire index. So in the dividend discount model, the value of stocks is the present value of dividends. So here's what I did. I took the dividends. I grew them at the rate and analysts said earnings would grow, 5.58% a year. I discounted the dividends at a cost of equity for the S&P 500. In many ways, getting a cost of equity for the S&P 500 is easier than getting the cost of equity for a company. Here's why. Your risk-free rate is the risk-free rate. What's the beta for the S&P 500? It's one. But then I have to take a stand on what I think is a reasonable equity risk premium. And let's assume I think a reasonable equity risk premium is what I've earned as my average implied premium over the last 10 years. Let's say that 5.11%. So I take risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, I get a cost of equity of 7.28%. So I take expected dividends, discount them back at the 7.28% cost of equity, I get 795 as the present value of dividends. Either we're on the verge of catastrophe in the market, or I missed something because the index was trading at 2059. What am I missing? I'm looking at the dividend portion of returns, but remember we said U.S. companies increasingly are buying back stock. So is there a way I can fix that? Yeah, I just added the buybacks back and said, let me look at the collective, I call these augmented dividends, just a fancy way of collective cash flows, and I redid the valuation with everything else held constant but changing dividends to total cash returns. I get 2,332 as a level of the index. The index has gone from being massively overvalued to undervalued by about 15 percent. You can do this with the index right now because I, you know, if you go to my uh, equity risk premium spreadsheet, I give you the cash flows in the most recent year, I give you the growth rate, I give you the index, and actually I let you decide, I, I use the spreadsheet right now to compute an implied, so I'm doing an IRR and I compute, you could actually take a stand on the equity risk premium, plug it in and you can value the index. And what's that going to tell you? It's going to tell you, based on intrinsic value and your view of the equity risk premium, are stocks under or overvalued? So I also told you up front that I don't do this and I don't base investments on it. You know why? Because when you look at making a stand on the implied premium, you're taking a stand on something that you don't control. With individual stocks, I can screw up, but at least it's things that I can see. It's... I'm not a market timer for a simple reason. I don't know where the implied equity risk premium is going. But if you are willing to take a stand and say, I think 5% is a reasonable premium for equity markets. Right now, stocks are undervalued by about 15%. Why? Because the implied premium, actually a little more than that, the implied premium I updated two days ago on April 1st is now up to 5.75%. So if you think you can settle for 5%, stocks are undervalued. If you think stocks need to make 7%, Stocks are overvalued. Every statement about the market is really a statement about equity risk premiums. So you can value any index if you feel willing to make a judgment on what a reasonable equity risk premium is. And finally, the number I know people are going to push back on when I put this up, this slide, I have a version of the slide from the start of 2019, is that growth rate. Because if you're really doing an intrinsic valuation, using an analyst estimate of growth rate is almost a no-no, right? Because we know analysts do strange things. 
You can actually make this a full intrinsic valuation because remember, in intrinsic value, the growth in earnings for, for companies collectively is going to be a product of two things because it's equity earnings. It's going to be a product of their return in equity and what percentage of their cash they retain as companies. So I actually computed a retention ratio based on total, total cash return, not just in dividends. U.S. companies, at least in 2015, were not retaining much cash because they were paying out so much in buybacks they were retaining only about 12.4% of their cash. But they were making a 16% return in equity collectively. You take the product of those two numbers, the growth rate you get is 1.99%, lower than the 5.58% that analysts were predicting, but it's an intrinsic growth rate. With that growth rate, the value that I get for the index is 1992, which is within shouting distance of the actual index. So if I use just dividends, stocks look massively overvalued. If I use dividends and buybacks and trust analysts to get the growth rate right, stocks look undervalued. And if I adjust the growth rate to make an intrinsic growth rate, stocks, this is like a Goldilocks story, but it's not meant to be. Basically, when you do intrinsic valuation, you have to decide what you want to use as a growth rate. And intrinsic valuation could argue, maybe my growth rate should be based on what companies do. So if you get a chance, open up the implied equity risk room from the start of April, and there's a choice I let you make on what the risk-free rate is and what the earnings will be. So you can make choices and value the entire index and at least get a sense of, hey, can I value the market? The answer is yes. Any questions on valuing markets? One, one, one use that I put this to is when you have big events that affect entire markets, of course, there's all this talk that comes about, is this good for the market or bad for the market? So when the tax bill was working its way through Congress, the end of 2017, of course, people were looking at the tax bill and saying, this is good for stocks. This is, and depending on their biases, they latched on to whatever part of the tax bill made their case. So you were somebody for the tax bill, you say, well, there's a lower tax rate. That must mean cash flows and earnings will be higher. Therefore, stocks will be more valuable. On the other side, the people who didn't like the tax bill say, if you, raise the, if you lower the tax rate, you're actually making debt more expensive. Do you see why? Because it's an after-tax cost of debt. That will push up the cost of capital, therefore value below. Both sides are right, but they're, all, they're looking at a piece of the picture. So here's what I did. I actually valued the S&P 500 with the numbers staying stable, but essentially changing just the tax rate. And when you change the tax rate with the pre-tax earnings, you end up with higher earnings, higher cash flows. And if you change the tax rate with existing debt ratios, you get a higher cost of capital. The net effect, at least changing just the cash flows, would have been an increase in value of about 9.7%. If you focused on both the pluses and minuses, it was a net plus for stocks because the cash flow effect dominant. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that now companies will adjust their debt ratios to the new reality. It's just a simple way of asking if this happens. So think about the day after Brexit. I don't know when that'll be, maybe 2035. The way this is stretching out, I have no idea. You can do the FTSE before and after. This is designed for big events and asking how will that affect the market. Okay. So now we're going to go into what I call the dark side evaluation. Of all the books I've written, this is my favorite title. And I'll give you a little bit of history here. Okay? Think of those four questions that you need answered to value a company. What are your cash flows from existing assets? What is the value of growth? How risky are you as a company? And when will you be a mature company? I'm going to make an obvious statement, but I'll make it anyway. When those questions are easy to answer, valuation is easy. So think about your own company if you want and say, well, those questions are easy to answer because then you can figure out how, why somebody in your group finished their valuation in 15 minutes and you took 15 days. And when those questions are difficult to answer, valuation becomes messy. Stating the obvious, but stating it anyway. So let's think about when those questions are easy to answer. If you have a money-making company with a lot of history, valuation just got easy, and here's why. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets, you show me your financial statements. I go through them. They tell me what you made last year. When I ask you what the value of growth is, you have a long history of returns on capital. They're based on my history. I've made 9%. The cost of capital is 7%. The you have a basis for the value of growth. When I ask you how risky are you, you show me five years of betas, the comparable companies, the debt ratio you've used, computing cost of cap. And when I ask you when will you be a mature company, in some cases you already were. My life got really simple. In some cases you'd say it'll be three years or five years because this is where I am in the life cycle. 
If all we had to do is value money-making companies with a lot of history, you don't need this class. In fact, you don't even need people. You could probably automate models. They feed in from S&P Capital like you. The spreadsheet works out. You could put an autopilot. But let's think about when it's difficult to answer these questions. The first is if I ask you to value a young company. I've been keeping track of the companies that have been most frequently valued in the class. And one of the companies is Tableau, which is the data. You know, the, the, it's a young company. In fact, I could go through the list. The most commonly valued companies are all young companies. Okay. So it was, you had uh, Yelp was valued by four people. It was, so essentially, you can go down the list, Shake Shack. I, I get a sense of what you like to do by just looking at the companies you value. Okay. You watch a lot of Netflix. You eat at Shake Shack. You know. uh, so it's, it's all young companies. Young companies, it's difficult. And you'll see why when I let you ask, ask and answer those questions. It is difficult to answer these questions with companies that f don't fit the accounting mold. What's the accounting mold? If you're an old-fashioned manufacturing company, you fit the accounting mold. If you're not, then we have problems. So if you ask me to value a pharmaceutical company, valuation becomes more difficult because I have to redo all the financials. Your earnings are not your earnings. Your book value is not your book value. Valuation becomes difficult when you face significant truncation risk. You ask me to value a Venezuelan company with the government might nationalize you in two years, I have a problem. You value, ask me to value a company with a lot of debt and negative earnings, I have a problem. Truncation risk is a risk you will not make. It. So before we look at those companies, let me load up the dice and make it even more messy. When you value a company, think of the three places you went to collect information. The first was you pulled up the financials for the company, the annual report, the 10K. Second, the company's been around, you pulled up its history so you could see what good years and bad years look like. And third, you pulled up information on other companies in the sector to see what a high margin, a low margin, a high revenue, low revenue was. You look at current financials, history, and comparables. One by one, let me knock your crutches out. If you're a young company, what do you not have? You have no history. You're a young company early in the life cycle. Your financials tell me very little about you because you didn't do much last year. And if every company in your sector looks just like your company, you have what I call the trifecta. You have no financials, no history, no comparables. And that's when the dark side will beckon. You say, come on over. The old rules don't apply. Earnings, that's for the 20th century company. You don't need to make money. Cash flows, who cares? And in this atmosphere, here's what you will see. You will see metrics that nobody has seen before. Like what? We look cheap per subscriber, per rider, per download. Metrics that you create because you're desperate. You need a positive number in the denominator. Nothing in your income statement is positive. You're going to go off the income statement. You keep telling me macro stories. Why should I buy Lyft? Because my mother takes Lyft all the time. Why should, why should I, because you, in a sense, you use the macro story as a defense. Well, I don't want to talk about the company. Let me talk macro stories. And you talk about paradigm shifts, which basically means you have no idea what's going on, so you'll call it a paradigm shift. I've seen 10 paradigm shifts in the last 30 years. None of them were, but you called them a paradigm shift. I can't, I can't explain what's going on. It's so much easier if I just called it a paradigm shift. That way, I don't have to explain it. To give you some context, in the late 90s, I would do these valuation seminars, peak of the dot-com boom. And somebody would come up to me during the seminar and say, you really cannot value Amazon.com using a discounted cash flow model, can you? They had this finger going like, this, please step back, you're going to hurt me. At the risk of grave personal injury, I said, yes, you can value Amazon using a discounted cash flow model. And they'd give me this look of total contempt, academic. And it's not meant as a compliment. Basically, means you really can't do it, but you can talk about it. And after about the fifth time of being called an academic, I got really pissed off. So I valued Amazon for the first time in 1998. And while I valued Amazon, I kept a journal. A journal of every roadblock I ran into, because everything I knew about valuation came from old valuation. How to get cash flows growth. None of them seemed to work, and everything was a roadblock. So I had to come around and come up with creative solutions. To show you how many roadblocks I ran into, by the time I was done with my valuation of Amazon, 
the journal was 75 pages long. And I never waste anything I spend that much time writing. So I slapped a title on the 75 journal, uh, pages. It's the dark side of valuation, can Amazon.com be valued? It's still on my website. You'll see the 1998 dateline. Everything I know about valuing young companies, I learned in the process of valuing Amazon. So there's a reason I go back to Amazon, because that's where, because everything had, I had to rethink, because nothing that I was taught really worked on Amazon. Talked about valuation as a craft. There was no book that said, valuing young companies, let me open up, let's see chapter one on how to estimate cash flows. And for many of you looking for something like that today with your company, it's not there. You've got to reason your way through. So here's what I'm going to do in terms of valuing difficult to value companies. First, I'm going to value companies across the life cycle. Today, we're going to spend a lot of time on valuing young companies. The process, the challenge. Then we're going to value mature companies. Usually easy to do, right? But mature companies that are facing an existential crisis. Where something they've done that's always worked has stopped working. And somebody's pushing them to change. A lot of big, mature companies face this, from Coca-Cola to Kraft Heinz, where things that used to be incredibly easy and profitable no longer work because the world changed under them. So we're going to talk about how to value those companies. Then I'm going to take you through an exercise, which is perhaps the most depressing exercise in valuation, which is valuing declining and distressed companies. And you see very quickly why it's depressing. It cuts against everything in our nature to put a negative revenue growth rate. But you have to. So we'll start with the life cycle. Then we're going to value companies in emerging markets. What's different about them? What do we have to watch out for? And we're going to end by looking at companies across the cycle. Financial service companies, commodity companies, and companies with intangible assets, companies like Amgen. So let's start with the challenge of valuing young companies. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to play the role of an entrepreneur. You've just started a business. It's got lots of promise. And I come to you with four questions. You ready? You can concoct whatever business you want in your head. I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? What's your answer going to be? What existing assets? I don't even own the chair. I sit in. OK, that was easy. We'll move on. I ask you, what's your value from future growth? You say, a lot. Can you be more specific? Not really. You don't have a business model. You don't, have a, you don't even know what you're going to do. You just know you have lots of promise. And I ask you, how risky are you? Very. But beyond that, you can't show me much, right? There's no bait I can look at, past prices, past earnings. And I ask you, when will your company be a mature company? You fall out of your chair laughing. Because you don't even know whether you'll make it through this evening. Now do you see why most people don't even try to value young companies? Every question becomes the equivalent of pulling teeth. So let me frame what we're going to do next by posing a very simple challenge. Most young companies have small revenues and big losses. You can safely predict that. That's where they are. Can a company with small revenues and big operating losses become a valuable company? Obviously, some of them make it. So help me out. It's very simplistically. What's going to happen to the small revenues? They have to become big revenues. And what's going to happen to the losses? They have to become profits. The two, for, the two key levers in valuing young companies is you need revenue growth to get the small revenues to large revenues. And you need a target margin. You know you're not going to make money soon. Now do you see why the first two inputs in the valuation that in my spreadsheet are, what's your revenue growth, what's your margin? Because without it, I'm going to be stuck. And there's a third loose end to tie up to get from small revenues to big revenues. It's not magic. I've got to put money back into the business. I've got to reinvest. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my favorite young company on which I've learned everything. It's no longer young, but it keeps trying to, act, no, trying to recreate its youth, which is Amazon. And I'm going to take you through a valuation of Amazon in January 2000. Okay. So let me set the stage. January 2000 was the peak of the dot-com boom. Amazon was the place to be if you were an investor. So AIMR, which is the parent organization for this CFA. Any CFAs in this room? No, no CFAs? OK. Um, this was one of the first live webcasts that they did. So they said, can you talk about valuing dot-com companies? Everybody's interested in that. So I took up Amazon, and I took a look at their numbers. And here's what the numbers look like. In the 12 months leading into 2000, 
their revenues were about a billion dollars, which for a US retailer is really small revenues. To give you a sense of difference, Walmart even then had revenues of 250 billion, Costco at the, so basically you can go down the list and retailers, tens of billions of dollars, they had a billion in revenues. Their operating loss was 410 million. My task is laid out for me. They have small revenues and big operating losses. So I'll take you through this valuation, and as I go through this valuation, it'll either strike you as incredibly optimistic or incredibly pessimistic, depending upon how much hindsight you bring into play. So at the time that I did this valuation, I gave them a compounded revenue growth rate of 42%. You're saying, why 42? Why not 60? I'll take you through the process of why 42, because that's clearly a key driver in this valuation. I gave them a 42% revenue growth rate, compounded annual for the next 10 years. They told me the first live webcast done, the technology was not advanced enough that people could ask me questions live. This, they emailed questions while you were they're watching the webcast. So I get the first question right after I say 42%. It says, why are you being so pessimistic about future growth? You know why it sounded pessimistic, right? They were comparing the 42% to revenue growth in the most recent year, which was 200%. So why is it so low? They missed the compound in the 10 years. They missed the fact that I wasn't using 42% in year one. I was actually using 150, but as I went through time, that number was decreasing. I thought I was being pretty optimistic, taking a billion in revenues into making it into 40 billion in 10 years. That's what 42% does. It makes your revenues grow 44 Small revenues have become big revenues. Half my job is done. Then I turned my attention to the operating margin, minus 36.7%. I said, what do I think Amazon will make in steady state? And again, I'll come back and tell you why I picked the number that I did. But the number that I picked was a 10% pre-tax operating margin. That happened to be the average pre-tax operating margin across brick and mortar retailers. You're saying, why don't you use the average margin across online retailers? Why didn't I? They were all losing money. So my argument is, you, second email question comes in, how come you're being so pessimistic about future margins? And you can see the basis, right? Remember the stories about how brick and mortar companies have much higher cost structures, therefore their margin should be lower than online retailers. So the question the person was asking, why can't online retailers in steady state have 15% margins? Because that's not the way competition works. Because if you end up with retailing in two different ways of delivering it, where brick and mortar retailers make 10% and online retailers make 15%, what are brick and mortar retailers going to do? They're going to shut down the stores and become online retailers. You're going to get margin convergence. So I explained that. And they said, this person wouldn't give up. He said, but why couldn't they converge to 15%? I said, that's, again, not the way the world works. Because by having two different ways of delivering retailing, guess who's empowered? It's neither brick and mortar nor online retailers, it's you and I as customers. 25 years ago, if you wanted to buy a TV, you drove to the electronics store, right? The slick salesman came to you and said, let me show you the perfect TV for you. And he pointed to the TV and said, this is the very best TV in the world. And this is the best price you can get on the TV. 25 years ago, if you wanted to check that claim, what would you need to do? Maybe you got consumer reports or something. You'd order it and two weeks later it'll come in the mail and you could read it. And then you drive 15 mile radius is looking for a, and they're all filled with slick salesmen all telling you the same thing. You know, two years ago, during Christmas, Best Buy covered up. There's going to be pictures, so if you're not on your best, just let it go, kind of cut it over. They're going to do it for graduation to see. So if you're going to fall asleep, <laughs> I'll ask them to cut it out of the page. So don't worry. So, don't, so just put your head down and go to sleep. <laughs> but if you think about two, two years ago, Best Buy, during Christmas, actually covered up all those computer scan codes on printers. And you know why they did it? Because cu customers were coming in, and the salesman would say, well, this is the best price on this printer. The customer was just scanning the code in and checking out the price in three other places. They said, no, no, that's not the best price. I can see $20 lower. The bottom line is, if you have two different ways of delivering the same business, margins are going to decrease. I think I'm being pretty optimistic. Assuming it so what I'm saying is I'm, my optimist hat is firmly on. I'm optimistic on revenue growth. I'm optimistic on margins.
So my negative margins become positive margins. It happens gradually over time, because that's a realistic. You can't normalize months. The next year, I'm going to make 10%. Now, to get from small revenues to big revenues, I need to reinvest. And this is where I got stuck the longest when I was valuing Amazon. You're saying, why? Because I looked at the existing way in which people estimated reinvestment. Here's the first. They said, take last year's capex depreciation and change in working capital and project things up. Didn't work with Amazon. You know why? It's a small company, and what they did last year told me nothing about the future. Strange things could happen in a particular year. That didn't work. You're saying, why don't you use return on invested capital times reinvestment rate? What's the return on invested capital going to look like for Amazon in early 2000? It's going to be a big negative number because they're losing a lot of money. What's the reinvestment rate going to look like? A big negative number because I'm re dividing reinvestment. By so you're saying this is very convenient. Big negative times big negative is big positive. <laughs> but you put a positive growth rate on the loss, it's just going to get bigger. So after about four or five days of struggling with this, I said, maybe I'm looking at reinvestment relative to the wrong variable. I was trying to link reinvestment to income. And the problem here was income was a negative number. So I said, there's only one number in this entire analysis which has substance that the entire company is going to build on, which is revenue. So I have to link re my reinvestment to revenues. Hence was born the sales to invested capital. Is that's the only way I can link revenues to invest. So basically, I said, if I can tell you how many dollars of revenues I get for every dollar of invested capital, I can use that to estimate reinvestment. And to get that number, I looked again across all retail companies. Notice how much more of my inputs come from looking outside the company with Amazon than it is looking at 3M. The reason being with young companies, much of what you learn comes from looking outside the company. That's why I could value Uber without knowing very much about the company, because everything about the company is out there. The three that you see there is what retail companies collectively generated as sales to invested capital. It's a very simple statistic. I take revenues for companies, and I divide by invested capital. The same invested capital I used in return invested capital is basically going to the denominator. So what does the three mean? For every dollar they invest, they get $3 in revenues. I'm home free. Here's what I did. I took the revenues in year one. They went from $1.1 billion to $2.8 billion. That's a $1.7 billion increase in revenues. I estimated the reinvestment by dividing that number by three. It's as simple as that. So every year I take the change in revenues, divide by three. I'll give you a way in which you can even get, you can, you can finesse this number. When I do this, I'm assuming that reinvestment and growth is contemporaneous, that when you reinvest, you get the growth right away. And businesses like this, that's going to be pretty close to the truth. But let's say you're a manufacturing company. If you reinvest today, you don't get the growth right away. You might have to wait two years. You know how you could adapt it? Just take the change in revenues in year three, and use that as your basis for computing reinvestment in year one, year four, year two. So basically, you can build in lags if you want. It's a flexible enough process, but I'm linking reinvestment to revenues. I don't see any other way of doing it. You s subtract out that reinvestment from the after-tax operating income. You get free cash flow to the firm. Incidentally, when you look at the after-tax operating income in years one and two, my EBIT and my after-tax EBIT are the same. And you can see why. In fact, for the first three years, my EBIT and after-tax EBIT are the same for a simple reason. I'm losing money. If I'm losing money, there's no tax benefit. The IRS doesn't mail me a check, so there's nothing. In year four, I am making money, but notice I'm still not paying taxes. Why? Because I keep track of my losses I carried forward. The best way to deal with NOLs and the discounted cash flow valuation is don't leave it hanging out there and deal with it at the end. Bring it into your cash flows. The entire benefit of NOLs is you pay less taxes. Might as well be explicit about the effect. So starting in year four, you start to see the NOLs kick in. In year five, I still have NOLs left in. By finally, in year six, I pay my full tax rate. So my after-tax operating income evolves over time. But in my optimistic story, look at what my free cash flows look like. In year one, I free cash flows a firm of minus 931 billion. In year two, I free cash flows a firm of minus a billion. In year three, you get the pattern, year three, year four, year five, year six, minus, minus. This is called cash burn. And people freak out about it. But if you have a young company, that's exactly what you should expect. Why are my cash flows so negative? Because I'm so optimistic about Amazon. That sounds 
strange, but that's exactly what's driving it. The more optimistic you get about a company, the higher its growth potential, the more negative your cash flows are. But there's one implicit assumption that I'm making here that might get me into trouble. Year one, let's assume that every single one of my numbers comes in exactly as predicted. I have a minus $931 million cash flow, right? What am I assuming Amazon is going to be able to do in year one? Implicitly, I don't make it explicit. What am I assuming they're going to be able to do? Raise capital. From where? Am I telling you from where? Because there are two ways you can raise capital, equity or debt. See the cost of capital? Everything here carries an implicit story. When I use 99% equity, 1% debt in my cost of capital, it also means that that minus 931 million, the bulk of it has to come from new equity. I'll also make a confession. Early 2000, I didn't even blink an eye at this because I said it's a dot-com company wanting to raise equity. How easy can that get? Because you're in the peak of a boom. But do you see why this could potentially be a problem? Because if you get into a market where capital markets shut down and you're not able to raise the cash, you could be right in every single one of your assumptions. And at the end of year one, when Amazon goes to raise the capital, if they cannot raise the capital, what happens then? The game is over. You don't get to see Nirvana. You see what Nirvana is? For this company to have value, what has to happen? It has to survive, become profitable, get that big terminal value. It's like that pot of gold in year 10. You're not getting there. It is an implicit assumption in DCF, which also means when you value young companies and startups with DCFs, you are almost hardwired to overvalue the company, right? Because you're coaxing this company. Which is one reason if you looked at the spreadsheet, I put in a number to try to capture the risk. Do you remember what that was? I said probability that you will not make it fairly. You, some of you just entered a number in there, but that's why I put it in there, because if you have a young company, I don't care how optimistic you and I are, there is a real chance you will not make it. And if you don't make it, what are you going to do? You're going to liquidate yourself. And if you're a technology company, what are you liquidating? Those Herman Miller chairs and pretty much nothing else, right? The people who sat in them have all fled. And that's why you can get Herman Miller chairs really cheap <laughs> in Silicon. I'm not kidding. If you want to buy second-hand chairs, you know, go into the Bay Area, Craigslist, lots of them. Because the first thing a technology company does when it starts up is buy everybody really expensive chairs. And when it liquidates, it's the only valuable asset left in the entire company. But those negative cash flows reflect the, my optimist hat is getting even more optimistic with each, because I'm assuming that small revenues will become big revenues, that losses will become profits, that they will be able to reinvest efficiently, and that they will survive those six years of cash burn. I discount those cash flows back at the costs of capital. Notice what I use, costs, not one cost, but costs of capital. You know why? Because the cost of capital for a company like Amazon will change over time. Why? Because my story for Amazon is changing. In year one, what's my story for Amazon? It's a money-losing small company. I give it a high cost of capital and a very low debt ratio. Very low debt ratio because they can't afford to borrow money, and a very high cost of capital because they're a risky company. And as you look at the spreadsheet, by the time I get to year, year five, my revenues are now 15 billion and I'm making 1.9 billion. It's no longer a small money losing company. It's been a pretty big money making company. And if nothing else, I would expect my cost of capital to evolve as my company evolves. So if you look at my cost of capital, it starts at 12.84% and ends at 9.6%. Your cost of capital should change for your company. So if you're building your own spreadsheet to do DCF valuation of a young company, you can't have one cost of capital that travels through time because you have an internal contradiction then between what you're telling me in the numerator and what you're using in the denominator. One final point, if you look at the cost of capital, the cost of debt and the after-tax cost of debt are the same for the first three years. Why? For the same reasons, my after so you can't just selectively put an after-tax cost of debt on your debt if you're a money-losing company with huge net operating losses. So the same tax rate feeds into both numbers. I discount my cash flows back at the cost of capital. And to top it all off, the cherry on my optimistic cake. When I get to year 10, I give Amazon a growth rate of 6% a year forever. Didn't I beat up Evercore for using a 6% growth rate forever? So why am I not beating myself up for using a 6% growth rate forever? Yeah. It wasn't what? 
It wasn't, I'm sorry. No, no, but we can't bring hindsight in, right? That would be, if I use that, then I'm in deep trouble because then you're going to say, why don't you get the, because then I'm opening the door to all kinds of questions I don't want to answer, right? There's actually a much simpler reason. It's a much smaller base compared to what you Yes, yeah, still it's, uh, because this is not the 6%, the 6% is not on the small base, it's on a big company. So I can't use today's small base, right? Yeah, it's, that's still not going to do it, yeah. Okay, let's now we're on to something. What is it? What's it? What is the T bond? What's the T bond rate right now? And when you guys the valuation, two point four percent. If you're doing it in dollars, use a six percent growth rate in an environment where the interest rate is two point four percent. You've got an internal problem because when you have a two point four percent rate, what does it tell you? There's going to be low inflation and low growth in the future, and you're kind of constrained to live in the economy you create with your discount rate. Take a look at the T bond rate in early two thousand. It was 6.5%. Inflation was about 5%. Real growth was about 1.5%. You know why I can get away with 6%? Because what one hand gives you, the other hand will take away. So I'm giving you this high growth rate, but before you get too excited, your discount rates are going to be much higher as well because I'm building off a bigger base. That's the advantage of locking in your risk-free rate as your cap. It comes with an internal mechanism that will change over time. So I gave them a 6% growth rate. But that's not the optimistic part of the terminal value assumption I made for us. Remember I said growth by itself does not create value. It's what excess returns you assume. I assume that Amazon would be able to earn 20% as its return on capital forever. Again, it looks outlandishly high in hindsight. But in 2000, retail firms collectively were making 18% return on capital. Higher inflation, higher growth. So. It's an optimistic story. And I keep emphasizing the word optimistic, but I discount these cash flows back to today. And there's a little mechanical thing that I should have talked about earlier, but when your costs of capital change over time, you have to be very careful about how you do discounting. You see what I mean, how do you do discounting? I use the present value function in Excel. You can't do it anymore. Because what does the present value function in Excel do? If you have cash flow in year seven, and you give it a discount rate in year seven, it takes the cash flow in year seven, discounts it back at your cost of capital for seven years. You can't do that here because if your cost of capital is changing, you have to discount at accumulated cost, which basically means if your cost of capital goes from 14 to 12 to 10, to discount your cash flow in year three, you discount at 14% for one year, 12% for year two, 10. If you wondered why there's that accumulated cost of capital line in my spreadsheets, it's precisely for that reason. When your discount rates are changing, it's always accumulated cost of capital. It's only when you have a constant cost of capital, you can use the shortcut. Raise the power three, raise the power four. So don't use the present value function in Excel. It will blow up on you if your discount rates are changing. So I discount the cash flows back. I get a value for the operating assets of 14.9 billion. Yep. So I'll just go back to the 6%. Yep. Like, this is bigger than the global GDP outlook growth, and not like becoming bigger than the whole Remember, Inflation is part of whatever. So real growth for the for global economy has never been more than three, three and a half percent. But if you're with a currency of five percent, remember this is all in nominal terms. So if you did your analysis in Brazilian reais, you can use an eight percent growth rate forever. And I'm going to let you do it, not because you're saying the global economy will grow at eight percent, but because you got a six percent helper kicking it up there, right? Inflation. So that's the, the missing ingredient is don't compare this to real growth. The global economy has never been able to grow at a 6% real growth rate for sustained periods. But nominally, if inflation is high, you can get 6% growth fairly easily. So I discount, I get 14.9 billion as my present value. Value of operating assets. I had cash, it's almost nothing, which tells you how confident Amazon felt about being able to raise cash. They let their cash balance pretty much run down. Subtract that, again, not much. You add not much, you subtract not much, you get a value of equity of 14.6 billion. Then I did a final stop. And this actually should show you why we spent so much time on employee-based compensation. I valued the options that Amazon has already granted. And I lost almost $2.9 billion in value. Why does Amazon have so much of an option drag? The first was pre-2006, this was the way all employees, so there were no restricted stocks. You know? So think of how many restricted stock units you saw in the Lyft prospectus. If this had been 2000, those would have all been options. 
And why did they grant options? Because they had no other way of paying for people, from employees. To, so essentially, this was the way of paying for things. And every time an option is granted, you and I as equity investors are paying for it. So that $2.9 billion is the option drag. I subtract out the options. I've taken care of options outstanding. I can now divide by the actual shares outstanding, because we talked about this. We value options and take them out. And I get a value of $35 per share, or $34 per share. Am I being optimistic all the way through? I thought I was. And you can't bring the benefit of hindsight and look at where Amazon is now and say, that wasn't that optimistic. In 2000, I was wearing my optimistic hat. And the reason I keep emphasizing the word optimistic is with all my optimistic views about Amazon, I'm getting a value of 34. Ask me, when you value a public company, always two questions away from being exposed as a fraud. Value public company, what's the first question you ask? Never value. What's the price? It's 84. Now ask me the second question. That'll tell you whether I believe my own valuation. Well, I clearly it wouldn't make any sense for me to buy the value. So would I short it, right? And if the answer had been reversed, half my portfolio had been trapped into buying. Because I value something and say, are you buying? And I'm trapped. But in this case, that's exactly the question. Are, are you shorting? And I'll tell you exactly the answer I gave on the webcast. I said, not in this lifetime. The pushback I got was, don't you have confidence? Don't you have faith in your value? I have more faith in that Amazon is overvalued in early 2000 than I've had in most of the companies I've bought that I found undervalued. Actually, we're getting closer to it. So if I feel that confident, why was I willing to buy something that was undervalued, even though I was less confident? Here I'm more confident, but I'm refusing to sell short. Louisa, what, what do you think the answer is? Well, convergence is always a problem, right? You know what I mean by convergence. The price has to move to the value. So if I buy something cheap, price has to converge to value. Either way, I need convergence. So what's different about buying, going long, and selling short? Okay, I'll set aside enough money. I feel confident enough that I can do it. Yep. Okay, now we're getting closer to a problem, right? I bought Amgen in 2007 because I thought it was undervalued. I thought it was. I didn't know it was. Stock was trading at 55, and I thought it was worth 74. I bought the shares. How long was I willing to wait? Remember, I'm not a portfolio manager. I don't have to answer to clients. All I have to do is answer to my spouse. <laughs> and a few years ago, I actually turned off the Schwab statement, so she has no idea what we have. <laughs> I can wait and wait and wait. So when I buy long, I control my time horizon. Especially, that's an advantage you and I have as individuals over a portfolio manager. Remember that. A fidelity manager can't afford to wait and wait and wait. Why? Because, their clients bank, because your clients claim to be long term. But every quarter they're knocking, what have you done for me lately? It's an advantage you have as an individual that if you're willing to exploit me, so I was willing to wait as long as it took. The day after I bought Amgen, the Medicare announced that they were yanking one of Amgen's blockbuster drugs from the Medicare list. You know what happened to the stock price? It went from 55 to 48. It's like the market knocking on me said, do you have faith? And with a long time horizon, I said, I do. But when I sell short, what am I doing? What does it mean, short sell? You borrow somebody's shares and you agree to return them. So in early 2000, I knew this question was coming. You could see it coming a mile away. So I called around to different brokers to see how much time they would give me if I sold short on Amazon. The most I was, they were, I was able to get, six weeks. The stock was in such high demand. It was, the trading was huge in dot-com stocks. Broker thought he was doing me a favor. He said, I can give you up to six weeks. So not only do I have to have faith that my value is okay, which I do, I also have to have faith that the market will correct within six weeks. And I wasn't willing to do that. It's one of the great asymmetries in investing. When something is undervalued, there is a bargain basement long-term stretch of just buying and holding. It's not easy, but you can do it. But if something is overvalued, you often don't have an equivalent strategy, which means if you have bubbles, they're far more likely to be upside bubbles than downside bubbles, because it's actually very difficult to get in the way of an upside bubble. 
Let me give you an example. Let's say in 2007 you were convinced there was a housing bubble. What exactly were you planning to do? Sell short your neighbor's house? <laughs> you walk out and say, can I borrow your house for a couple of years? You could see a housing bubble. There was nothing you could do. But having said that, what's this room called? The Paulson Auditorium, named after, not Hank Paulson, but John Paulson, who made his, the bulk of his billions doing what? Betting on that housing bubble, because he got creative. He found a way to indirectly bet in the bubble, and because it was so difficult, he happened to have one of the few people willing to put a lot of money on it. So don't give up. If you find a bubble and you're not able to do it directly, maybe, maybe there's a creative way of playing it. But in this case, I said, no, I'm not buying. So I'm going to take this valuation and talk about the lessons I extracted from it, because these are still lessons I bring to valuing young companies. Here's the first one. I'm sorry. Remember I said don't trust regression betas? When we talked about betas? That goes in spades when you're talking about valuing young companies. For here, for instance, is the beta that I pulled up for Amazon at the start of 2000. There's a beta page. Regression beta, raw beta, 2.23. But take a look at the second to last number in that box. It says standard error 0.50, which means the true beta for Amazon can be anywhere from 1.2 to 3.2. So let me explain how I got a beta 1.6 for the first five years and one after year five. For the first five years, I used the betas for online retailers as my beta for Amazon because I said the online is what I think about when I think about Amazon, so I'm going to go online retailing. But by the time I get to year five, they've got 15 billion plus in revenue. So I said I'll think retailing first and online next, so I moved to the beta for all retailers. You think are you allowed to do that? Yeah. You control the process. If you're valuing a young company, the subset you use for your bottom-up beta can be very different in the early years than the later years. My debt ratio was close to zero up front. Why? Because they couldn't afford to borrow money. But what am I doing to Amazon over the next 10 years? I'm making them a money-making machine. And guess what? If that happens, they can afford to borrow money, so it gave them a debt ratio of 20%. My cost to capital changes because my beta and my debt ratio change over time to keep up with what I'm assuming about the company. So that's the first stop. Now let me turn to the key number. Because the two key drivers of the Amazon valuation, I'll make the confession, is the 42% compounded growth and the 10% target margin. Many of you struggle with this when you're valuing your own companies, and you thought about how, oh, should I use 25, should I use 30? Because there's, no, you can't, there's no, nothing in history that's going to help you. There's no outside source you can really go as. You're really in no man's land. It makes people uncomfortable. So let me be quite open about how little I knew about this process and what I had to do to get these growth rates. Here's what you should never do when you value young companies. Don't move sequentially through the years. You know what I mean by sequentially? You do year one, then you do year two, and because that's how we're taught to do things. Don't do that with young companies, because by the time you get to year five, you'll have no hair left, because you'll be pulling your hair out, you'll be completely uncomfortable. So here's what I did. Because I felt uncomfortable forecasting year one, two, and three, I did something very different for Amazon. It's going to sound weird. But I asked myself, what do I visualize success at Amazon to be? Which requires taking a sand, right? It brings in everything you know about the company. And I liked Amazon as a company. I loved the way Jeff Bezos ran the company. And I said, I think this company is going to be a big retailer. Here's the first step. Then I said, what does a big retailer look like? I went and pulled up brick and mortar retailers in early 2000 and looked at the revenues. At the top, of course, was Walmart at 250 billion, and you kept going down the list. I said, would, in, my, in my story at least, do I see Amazon becoming a Walmart? In early 2000, I said, no, I don't see it as a discount retailer with low margins. And I kept going down the list, and it's completely subjective, and I don't view that as a bad word. I said, no, my story, I think they'll become the sixth largest retailer in the world, somewhere around that. And the sixth largest retailer had revenues of, guess what? About 40 billion. I was off to the races. I'm at a billion right now. I need to get to 40 billion. You know what my revenue growth rate is all designed to do, right? Get me from a billion to 40 billion. So if you ask me the question, how did I come up with the revenue growth rates from years one through 10? I'll make a confession. I made them up. And I'm okay with that. If you push me on year one and say, hey, I think it's going to be 163.55% in year one, you can have year one. You want year two, take year two too. If you give me the starting and the ending points in this valuation, I control the valuation. 
in young companies, it's the end game that matters. It's what you think this company will grow to that will drive the value. In this case, my story, and this is why stories matter. My story, it becomes a large retail company, but not a discount retailer. The revenues that go with it are 40 billion. So a billion becomes 40 billion. Half my problem got solved. The only rule I followed for the year-specific numbers is I started high and went low because the compounding effect kicks in. Then I turn to margins. Right now, I'm at minus 36.71%. Where would I like to get? Plus 10. Again, the last thing I want to be doing is trying to estimate margins on a year-to-year -year basis. So I beg for some guidance here. Say, can, is there some way I can get my Excel spreadsheet to fill in the next 10 years? And I was able to find an algorithm that got me from minus 36.7 to plus 10 without my even taking a roll. I just put the algorithm in, into the spreadsheet and it filled in the middle numbers. So I'm going to ask you to guess what that algorithm is by giving you the numbers. So right now at minus 36.7, based on my algorithm, my margin next year is minus 13.35. That looks awfully precise, right? When you look at that number, you're saying, this guy must be doing lots of research in year one. No. Year two, it's minus 1.68%. Year three, it looks awfully precise, but it's actually driven by a very simple algorithm. Can you guess what that algorithm was? How did I get from minus 36.7 to minus 30? Okay, so let's spread it out. When you say halfway, where am I right now? Where do I want to be? Plus 10. What's the distance? 46.7. I took half the distance. That brings me. Now in minus 13.35. I need to get, I took half the, you're saying why half? Why not? <laughs> and I'll tell you, and it sounds facetious, but I'll tell you why I built it around this. When I build a valuation spreadsheet, I want to build in a way where if you disagree with me, you know exactly what to change. By using half, what am I doing? I'm telling you something in my story about the pathway to profitability, that it's going to be pretty smooth, that Amazon is going to go pretty quickly to 10%. Let's say in your story, you don't agree with that part of my story. You say, I think it's going to take a lot longer. There's going to be a lot more pain. What's the easy way to do that? Take the half and make it one quarter. If you do that, what's going to happen? I'm still going to start at minus 36.7. I'm going to end at 10, but you're going to lose more money for a longer period before you turn around. If you make it 0.1, it's going to get even more painful. You're going to lose money for eight years. It's the simplest mechanism I can think of. And in fact, in your spreadsheets, this is the year of convergence. That's what it does. It tells you the, it's the part of your story about how quickly you can move to profitability that that year of convergence does. If you set it to one, it's the most optimistic story because then you go from minus 36.7 to plus 10 next year and you're all set. So my margins come out. So if I have my revenues and my margins, I have my operating income. And as I said, once you have the operating income, the after-tax number is a function of taking care of that NOL. And you've got to do it explicitly because it's not just the NOL you carry in, but every time you lose money, that NOL gets bigger, and then you use it to shelter your taxes. And as I'm doing all of this and pushing it out 10 years, I have to remind myself that this company already is a pretty special company to be able to pull that off. Because most growth companies don't grow for very long. This is actually from a study of companies that go through IPOs and tracks the revenue growth of these companies relative to the revenue growth of the sector they're in. So these are companies just gone public. One year after the going public, if you look at the revenue growth, it's 15% higher than the revenue growth of the sector they're in. Two years later, it's down to 7% higher. Three years later, it's down to 3% higher. By the time you get to year five, you can't tell that young, huge growth potential company from the rest of the sector. Most companies' growth fades very quickly. So when I use a 10-year growth period for Amazon, I'm already pushing the limit on the company and saying, this is a special company. And I believe that in 2000. But if you have a young company and you look and say, I don't say anything special about this company. It just sends me emails about special deals. That was my Groupon problem. He says, so what's so special about you? You got my email address first? OK. What else? Because after you got past that, there was very little at the, on the company, at least at the time that it went public, where you could say, that's going to make that company be able to sustain its growth rate. So look at your competitive advantage. This is where your story about what's unique about this company is going to kick in. And then just because it's a young company doesn't mean you abandon all the rules about reinvesting to grow. We made a big deal. If you want to grow, you have to reinvest. You can't just abandon all those rules just because you're a young company. 
And that's where the sales to capital ratio helps you because it tells you how much you need to reinvest just based on change in revenues. There's one feedback loop on the spreadsheet that if you're willing to listen can help you decide whether you're reinvesting or not. Here's what's happening in my spreadsheet. Because I have revenues and margins, I'm getting after-tax operating income in the future, right? That's coming from my revenue and margin assumptions. When I use my sales to capital, I'm getting reinvestment every year. But one thing to remember about reinvestment, it's actually a delta in invested capital. It's how much your invested capital changes each year. So if you look at the third from the last column, I'm taking my reinvestment every year and adding it on to my invested capital and keeping track of what I think will happen in invested capital in my story in Amazon. By the time I get to year 10, my invested capital is up to 13.1 billion, given how much I've reinvested. I took my own after-tax operating income that came from a different part of my story, divided by the invested capital I get from my reinvestment story, I get an imputed return on capital. This is the return on capital my story is giving the company in year 10. And here's where the feedback part of it comes in. I took a look at that return on capital in year 10, 20.39 percent, asked myself, am I comfortable with that? as a return on capital for this company, given what I know about it. And in 2000, my answer was, I'm okay with that, 20.39. It's a couple of percent higher than the typical retail company. And because I'm going to give them a 20% return on capital in perpetuity, I'm okay with that. You say, what would you have not been okay with? If that had been 200.39%, what's my spreadsheet telling me? You're not reinvesting enough. And if I'm listening, what can I fix? The sales to capital ratio is a number I estimate. It's not some number that came from outside. So if I lower the sales to capital ratio, I will reinvest more. My return on capital will come. So that's why if you look at my spreadsheet, I actually give you the imputed return on capital. It's the second to last row somewhere in there. So if you want to, you can look at it and say, am I OK? Am I building a company that's just going to blow up on me? Or is it a company where I'm reinvesting enough? So the reinvestment number is essentially a number to keep the company in steady state. And but the young, yeah, go ahead. Okay, that's a good question. Should the sales to capital ratio change over time? Because you, in, it depends on your story. In your story, if there are economies of scale in investing, the way it'll show up is you'll start with a low sales to capital ratio, and actually increase it. In fact, if you want to get really clever, you know what you can do? If you have an end return on capital for a company. You can actually use Excel to solve for a... So you can make this as fancy as you want, but as long as you keep control of the process. So your sales to capital ratio can change over time. It can be computed based on your ending return on capital. But they're all things that you control. Nothing in this valuation is being thrust upon me. So when I don't like the value, guess who I should blame? Myself and my story. There's nothing from outside that's driving this. It's all about my story and my inputs. And because it's a young company, you have to remember to mop up. One was the equity options, right? It took a big chunk of the value. Make sure you take into account all those claims. When I valued Lyft, I counted all of the restricted stock units precisely for this reason. I can't just ignore them because the company says, oh, they're OK right now. It's my job to kind of look into the future and say, this is what I should worry about. And if you have two classes of shares, this is your last chance to tell me whether you're going to do something about it. A little later in the class, I'll give you a me mechanism for attaching a premium to voting shares. But that's something to worry about increasingly with young companies in the US. You didn't used to be that way. You look at Microsoft, Apple, all the great companies. Because they all wanted to end up on the New York Stock Exchange. Those days, that was the end game. And the New York Stock Exchange did not allow it. But this has become an issue for US companies. And you might have to deal with it. It's a graph, actually, that comes, I think, from the Department of Labor in the US. It keeps track of young startups. And then looks at how many of those startups make it through year one, year two. Year. So the way to read this graph is, let's go to all firms. For every 100 firms that get started, only 81 make it through year one. And if you go all the way through, by the time you get to year seven, only 31% of companies make it. The rate of failure is highest in the early years. So if you gave me a really, really young startup, pre-revenue. I know, given statistics, that are very high percentage. As you stay in there and you get bigger and you raise more capital, your chances of survival will improve. You're saying, so what? If you're valuing a young company, that's non-trivial that the company might fail. And if it fails, you might make nothing. So as an equity investor, that's got to be part of the game. Do venture capitalists know this? 
Absolutely. Sensible venture capitalists do. What's their technique for dealing with the fact that most companies don't make it? Do you know what uh, venture capital target returns look like for startup companies, what they claim they demand as a return? 65%. You know what the collective return for venture capitalists was last year? It's closer to 14%. Clearly, what they claim they will make is not what they make, and the reason is what they do is they pump up the target rate of return to cover the fact that eight of these 10 companies they back will never make it. It's not a great way to deal with failure because you're making your discount rate carry the burden. When in fact, it's got nothing to do with the riskiness of the cash flows. It's you got the truncation risk. And that's why I think it's better to keep it separate and ask the question, what's the likelihood that my company will fail and bring it to your numbers? So I finish the valuation and I get a question, a very plain two question. Somebody probably had a lot of money invested in Amazon. And she said, is it possible that Amazon is worth $84 per share? What's the answer to the question? Possible is such a weak word. Of course it is. In fact, I'll tell you exactly what has to happen. You have to have much higher revenue growth and much higher margins. Is it possible that Lyft is worth $30 billion? Yes. All I need to do is increase it. So this is something that I think is sensible to ask and answer because there will be people who say, well, isn't it possible? Yes. And then the question I would ask is, do you want to put your money on a bet of revenue growth being 60%? In other words, Amazon has to grow like Walmart and have ma margins like Ann Taylor. Is that what you want to build your investment thesis on? It's a break-even analysis. It's a good thing to do because you have the numbers right there. Just do the what-ifs right there. And finally, depressing truth. You're going to be wrong 100% of the time. What I mean by that is I've never done a valuation where all the cash flows come in exactly as predicted. It'll be creepy if it did, it did happen. It can't happen. And that's okay. You don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. Just remind yourself of that. It brings down your anxiety level and says, look, because you try to put pressure on yourself. How do I know I'm right? I'll save you the trouble. You're wrong. So you don't even have to ask, how do you, you're wrong. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. So with young companies, you're going to be wrong, but here's the saving grace. What do, what do I mean when I say you're wrong? A year from now, when you come back and value the company value today, you're going to give me a different value. And you're going to beat yourself up and say, oh, I gave you 28 last year. I'm giving you 21 now. I'm really sorry. Don't be. Because if you think you change your mind in your valuation, you should see what the market does. Remember the 2000 valuation, there's Amazon, 84, my stock, my value was $35 per share. What did I, when, when you pushed me, was I selling short? I gave you the little song and dance about time horizon and I escaped, but not for long. A year later, I revisited Amazon and valued it. The value dropped from 35 to 20. You're saying, why? The dot-com boom bust, the economy went into recession, the world had shifted under me. Of course, my value is changing. But before you beat me up for changing my value from 35 to 20, take a look at what the stock price did. It went from 84 down to 11. And I was trapped. Why? What is the question you think I was asked in 2001? Why am I buying? Now there's no dancing around and talking about time horizon. I did. I did. And you know the old adage in, in value investing, just buy and forget? I don't even know who comes up with this crap. I can't buy and forget it. Why? But why did I buy it? Because it was undervalued. For it to stay in my portfolio, what has to be true? It has to stay undervalued. How do I check for that? I can't just keep checking to my original value. I've got to revalue it. One year later, I revalued it, and it stayed. You know why? Both the price and the value had shifted, but it was still undervalued. Two years later, I did the process again, and now my value had actually gone up dramatically, but the price had gone up even more. It's time for me to leave. If the time for me to come in was when you were undervalued. So I bought Amazon for the first time in 2001. I sold it in 2003. I bought Amazon four times, actually five times in the last 20 years, and I've sold it five times, which kind of tells you where I am right now, which is Amazon's not my portfolio. But it essentially reflects the fact that investing can never be this one-time deal. You value price, and then you buy, and then you forget. How can that even be value investing? It, it, it doesn't even ring true. So when you value something you, and you come up with a buy at the end of the semester, and you actually buy, which some of you might, 
don't just forget about that investment because it's a, and it's, it sounds like a lot of work. I have 40 something stocks now in my portfolio. Every year I've got to revisit them at least once. You think, what do you mean, what do you mean at least once? If I had Boeing in my portfolio, I have to visit it multiple times in the last few weeks because when something big happens, you've got to revisit that valuation. But it's maintenance valuation because once you value the company, the next time around you're not doing everything from scratch. And the more often you do it, the less maintenance valuation you're doing. It's actually easier to do this on a regular basis. I usually do it around an earnings report. I build it on an annual earnings report, and if there's something big in a quarterly report, I'll revisit the valuation. But it basically means I have a mechanism for checking value against price. So I, this is something I almost never do, because when people look at it, it's always, oh, you were wrong. And since I knew I was wrong, I'm never surprised by what I find. So I went back in 2014 and looked at the actual revenues and margins at Amazon in the 10 years that I'd forecast. Remember in 2000, I'd forecast the numbers? I wanted to see how close or far away I got from the truth. Let's look at the revenue numbers. There are my forecast numbers. I actually got incredibly close in year one. <laughs> right? 2000. But before I you know, congratulate myself, as, I, as you go through time, what do you see Amazon doing? They're just beating up my revenue numbers. They're growing a lot faster than I thought they would. That's a good side of the story. On, see, because I was predicting revenues would go to 51 billion, they actually grew revenues to 85 billion, much more. Yeah. The early years, they were slower, but then they took off. And then I looked at the margins, and this was the bad half of the story. In my story, that margins would improve to 10%. You look at the 10 years, what do you see about the, the actual margins? Amazon continued to look like a startup through 2010. So what, if, if, if I were redoing my story now based on what I'm learning, this is a company that is not quite done in terms of being a startup. It's a very, so this, you can see that as you look back at your story and you come up with the numbers, you gotta revisit the story. In 2012 actually, their cash flows went negative. Big negative, which you expect in a startup. And I redid my story, and here's what my redone story said. I said so far, from 1998 through 2012, I was valuing Amazon as an online retail company, giving them bigger and bigger shares of the retail business. But I said the way they're behaving, that's not what they seem to think of themselves as. I said they're really not an online retail company, they're a disruption platform. What are they looking for? Any soft business. Your banking, you look soft, I'll come after you. Your logistics, you look soft. You see what this does? It expands the potential business. It's a much bigger story. A more challenging margin thing, because you're no longer looking at the margin of retailers. So when I valued in September 30th, 2018, I valued it as a disruption platform. I bent over backwards. Again, I always wear my optimistic hat with Amazon, because this is a company where you're a pessimist, you get killed. So wait a minute. the value that I came up with was 1,255 per share. That's around, around 1,250. The stock was trading at almost 2,000. So ask me the question. Did I sell short? And I did. Selling short has become much easier in the last 20 years than it was. I can actually sell short for a year, year and a half, two years. I sold short. And I was terrified. Because I've seen what Amazon has done to other short sellers in the past. You can be right. Remember, the market can be rational for longer, and you can be stomped by price momentum. And I got incredibly lucky. I'd love to say I got the timing right. It was, no, I saw this coming. I really expected to get stopped. But I wanted a story to I'll get a sell short, I'll lose money, and then I'll use that to illustrate to people why you shouldn't sell short. Unfortunately or fortunately, things didn't work out that way. Because I caught it at exact, it's never happened to me in my life. I got it exactly on its peak day. And one thing I did do, though, was when I did my valuation, I actually wanted the world to see how uncertain I was about my value. Because a lot of assumptions I'm making about this disruption platform. And I took crystal ball, I put in my Excel spreadsheet, and I made my big assumptions into distributions. I said, look, I know my expected value is 1,250, but I also have to tell you that this is Amazon that I could be wrong, and not just wrong, but horrifically wrong, because there are these scenarios, and they're not trivial, where they could be worth $3,000 per share. 
I'm selling short, but I'm selling short with open eyes, which is six months from now or two years from now, I can look back and say, I wish I hadn't done that. But at least the odds look like they're in my favor. And one thing I did, and this is something I've increasingly started doing when I buy, is why am I buying? Because the stock is trading way above the value, right? So at the time that I, I'm sorry, why am I selling short? Because the stock, right? So I sold short, and I put in a, a limit buy, open order, on the stock at about 1,400 and around 1,400. See why? Because if, the, if I'm right and the stock starts to come down, I want this to be automatic. You know why I want it to be automatic? When you're right on an investment, you're in a very dangerous place. You feel really good about yourself, and you think it was all you're doing. And the longer you're right, the more you convince yourself that you want to stay right, and you find new ways to convince yourself to hold on to that stock where you made a lot of money, and convince yourself everything's okay. So by putting an autopilot, it said, I'll come back and revisit the valuation, but if this happens really fast, I want this to be out of my hands. And if you tracked Amazon towards the end of last year, between September 30th and I think November 17th, the stock dropped below 1400 I got the order of the, the thing from Schwab saying, your buy happened this morning. I went to Chipotle and got myself an extra large burrito. <laughs> and then I said, don't read too much into this because the danger here is you take this and then you say, I'm really good at selling short. Now, who can I sell short next? Let me try Salesforce. Let me try. No, I can't do that. But this is, I think, why we do valuation is, you know, sometimes you're going to be right, sometimes you're wrong. And if you're right, it's often luck. So we'll continue with uh, valuation on Wednesday. Yeah. Depends on the business. Like retailing, there's almost no economies of scale because growing basically means opening more stores. In manufacturing, there might be if the basic physical facility can be expanded and investment means. So it really is very, very safe. In manufacturing, you're more likely to see increasing sales to capital ratios as a company gets bigger. In things like ride sharing or retailing, there is no economies of scale. In fact, it might get more difficult after you've got the initial cities to build it. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. So it really depends on the, again, it's a function of the business and the story. Okay. <clears throat> what base? What beta? You said that you disrupt everything. Your beta is going to be pretty close to one. Your beta is going to be pretty close to one, and you're going to disrupt pretty much everyone, right? So, that's that's it. Like a mutual fund, except you're very aggressive and disruptive mutual fund. That's a scary thing about Amazon. I don't know where they're going next. We talked to the 20 largest companies in the West. This is who you're most afraid of. Amazon's on the list. Uh, I was just wondering, how do you determine like what size of your portfolio to buy long or sell short? Like for Amazon, did you? I don't even have that. Basically, if I find an opportunity, what, what does it mean? What portion? Yeah, like how much of your portfolio? I never portfolio? let anything be more than five percent. Okay. In fact, one of the problems with picking a winner right. is you got to prune it right. as it grows. So when I bought, I mean, one of my most successful investments of all time is buying Apple in '99. So did you trim it every time it kept? And every time it popped up, I had to sell, which meant that I left a lot of money on right. the table. But I'd rather do that than end up with a portfolio that's 45% Apple. Right. Because then you're one shock away. Because this is my money. It's my right. pension money. I can't right. afford to play with it. I'm not a, but if you're a hedge fund or somebody wants high returns, you can see very quickly why they're going to sometimes bet big on small things because mm -hmm. their reputation is built on showing doubling of your money. Mm -hmm. And that's how you end up with these value investing funds with 45% of the money invested in Valiant, which is what happened when Valiant right. collapsed, is took down some really prestigious big name value funds. Mm -hmm. 
in your first reaction, how could you let 45% of your fund become value? The reason was that you're riding up, this is how you built your reputation as a great value fund. You built your one stock. Mm -hmm. The danger is, if it blows up, it takes the entire fund with it. So I, my usual rule is I don't ever invest more than 5% in an entry position. And once it gets past 10%, I prune it to keep it at 10% by the way. Okay. Which means you're doing constant pruning where the stock mm -hmm. keeps pushing the limits and pushing up. Yeah. How about a short position, though? Because would a you start at a 5% of your portfolio? is interesting because it right. creates cash flow to the rest of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I have to follow the same rules. There's cash coming into the portfolio. I don't want...